All right, and then we uh, this month we have Amir Rajan, um, certified code hobo, going to share his breadth of knowledge with us today over the last 10 years of development, uh, or how he assumes the last 10 years of development went. Why don't you take it away, Amir? Awesome. Um, any shout outs for anyone? Does anyone want to do any shout outs about new events or anything from within the community or the speakers that are out there right now or the uh, attendees that are out there right now? I haven't learned much in the last 10 years. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like, you know, fluff up the time. It's going to be a very short presentation. <laughs> Okay, uh, actually, um, I don't see my Zoom chat. I think I've lost that somehow. I have it I have it back up now, fantastic. So I got Zoom chat up and I've got uh, Slack up also. So if you have any questions during the presentation, um, you can post it inside of the Zoom chat or the Slack chat and uh, I'll try my best to keep an eye out for it. And uh, I think um, someone was volunteered to uh, facilitate Q&A if needed. All right, so 10 years of development. Um, we're in 2020 part two, uh, from, what I, from what I understand. So we can start up uh, with regards to where, uh, where things were back in, in 2010. And um, surprisingly, uh, this, is, this is what I was doing in 2010. Can, you, can everyone see this okay? The, the text, do I need to make it bigger? I'll make it a little bit bigger. How about that? And um, 2010 what, <clears throat> 2010 was uh, actually when I started at uh, Improving Enterprises. And um, I was a, uh, I actually invested quite a bit into Silverlight around that uh, point in time. And um, everyone knows what happened to Silverlight. Um, it's no longer a thing. But uh, back when back in 2010, it, it was still it was still kicking pretty well. And um, the interesting thing with Silverlight was uh, there was an aspect of it called uh, RIA services. And uh, RIA introduced the this idea of asyn asynchronicity and a different approach to building um, remote APIs. And um, a lot of the talk, uh, a lot of this uh, the pr this presentation will be. I'm gonna take it a year at a time. I'm gonna to try to scope uh, each year to, to about uh, five minutes and then uh, leave it open for some questions. And then we'll go to the next year. So in 2010, this is, this is kind of where I was and um, we're gonna see the evolution of, of, of technology over this time, at least through, through the lens that I was looking through. Um, another thing that happened in 2010, so we had RIA services, Web API and WCF REST uh, started becoming a thing. Um, Nancy, uh, which was um, a port of a of a framework out there called uh, uh, called Sinatra from from the Ruby ecosystem, was there. Uh, Open Rasta was another REST um, type of, uh, I would say, like guidance. Um, it was just a it was just a organization of what a solution structure would look like. And um, that was that was a, a big contender back in the day, and then this concept of hypermedia as the engine of application state, uh, which had the ho horrible abbreviation of Hadeus. Um, I hate that. I, I really didn't like that abbreviation, but um, it was a thing. And um, during this time period is I think where a lot of the uh, the initial uh, foundational I guess discoveries were happening around what remote APIs uh, look like. Um, a lot of this was probably because of, you know, front-end JavaScript frameworks that were happening around that time. And um, looking back in the 10-year period, especially with the evolution of APIs and REST APIs and kind of the frameworks that exist today, um, I've, I kind of distilled back to a foundational aspect of what, what a REST API should be. And um, here, is, uh, here is the perfect example of a REST API. Let me bring up the website. So think about, think about how, uh, I'm sure a lot of people these days, uh, I mean, a lot of devs today are uh, building REST APIs. I'm sure a lot of y'all are using um, all the 
really great frameworks that are out there. And um, I've looked at, I've, I've thought quite a bit about those frameworks and then kind of uh, distilled, distilled uh, my interpretation of a REST API into, um, into what I'm about to show you. And for me, the perfect REST API is, is this. And um, what you're looking at is a website. It's, it's just a website. Um, the interesting thing with this website is that it's a website that serves up HTML and uh, actually doesn't have any JavaScript. Uh, it's actually an amazing website. I really like this website a lot. But what I found was that this idea and this, uh, this, um, this uh, vision that we have of self-documenting REST APIs uh, was something that we had all along. And um, with regards to uh, with regards to this website, it's exactly what it is. It's a it's it's a self documenting API right here, um, and here you can see what inventory is available, what items are available for sale. Um, you have images. It's not a well formed REST API, but the foundational aspects of what I see as a self documenting uh, remote endpoint to interact with is exactly what you see here. Um, we think about let's say we uh, we think about actual like product product and checkout processes and how do we convey forms and what payloads can be sent to an API uh, well you we implicitly get that through through a form so this right here is a self documenting http post for for uh, purchasing this this specific item and um, i feel like uh, over the um, over the decade, we've kind of reinvented this in a form that is better. I think maybe, maybe not. Um, it's it's kind of it, it kind of I kind of struggle with this this idea of uh, what a REST API looks like, uh, especially in the context of what we do today, and then compare it back to you know just a simple website. Um, but this was one of the one of the big lessons that I've learned uh, from from back in twenty. 2010 with regards to specifically RIA services and some of the evolutions that we had uh, in hypermedia and, and how, we, how we presented these, um, these specific systems. And when all was said and done, for me, the concept of a, of a really good self-documenting REST API is, is exactly what you see here. It's just, um, it's just a website without, without JavaScript. And a bit, hopefully, a little bit more well formed. If I actually do an inspect on elements, um, there might be some additional metadata inside of the tags themselves. But the the foundational aspect is is uh, what you see right here. Uh, I think this is still up, hopefully, but we're about to find out. Uh, we're at the five minute mark. Uh, do we have any questions with regards to 2010 and REST APIs and? Uh, all these evolutions that occurred and didn't occur and whatnot. But here, here's another REST API. As far as interacting with the website, um, you can use Nokogiri Noku, to, parse, to parse the XML and bring it up. So here's, our two, here, here's all two letter words. If I do uh, inspect element and view source on it, you'll notice that um, each one of them has, has a specific ID. Uh, it's got some, uh, it's a rel for what kind of help it is. In this case, it's external help for a defined tag. Um, you've got your form, your implicit form. Again, it has all the information that you need to actually uh, query this REST API, but all the information's there. Any questions, comments, criticisms, thoughts? Am I crazy? If not, we can move on to 2011. I'll give you all uh, 20 seconds. I can see Eric smirking. He's rolling his eyes. He's like, this, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. It's the dumbest idea ever to just serve up a web page. Nothing? Everyone's leaving? Don't leave because now we get a... Uh, a new lesson. And so all the horrible things that I've just spoken about just go away. 
and uh, we get to start start anew all over again. All right, so let's talk about 2011. Uh, so in 2011, um, my journey. This is this is about when my journey with uh, uh, open source contribution uh, started started happening, and um, uh, I invested uh, quite a bit uh, in the in the .NET ecosystem, and um, just just understanding how to build how to how to build uh, websites using ASP.NET MVC in in a way that felt um, less less heavy, uh, required, required less, um, less boilerplate. Uh, it felt something that felt more responsive with regards to, uh, quickly prototyping something. And, uh, during this process, uh, the, around the time, I think we were in C sharp 4.5, maybe, I think we were in 4.5, 4 maybe heading to, uh, 5.0 around that's around this time period and um, during this process uh, I started exploring the capabilities of C sharp um, we have a comment I was I was head deep in intelligent community server yep <laughs> 2011 was a long time ago uh, I think it's just it's kind of crazy to think about but it's it's been a very long time um, but uh, but I was looking at C sharp and exploring uh, the power that uh, C sharp provided as as a language runtime, and um, I know uh, four point five uh, with regards to like lambda expressions. You know we have our uh, we have our like uh, people dot select, and then and. Uh, Right, we've got our beautiful lambda expressions that it's almost almost can't uh, live without it anymore. Right, it's it's just such a fundamental part of uh, of how I write C sharp these days. And um, you know, before before lambda expressions, this this was um, it's just hard to imagine life without lambdas. And um, this was brought up in uh, C sharp four point five, and then. Another interesting thing that was brought up, of course, was uh, the dynamic keyboard. And I'm sure uh, many people shied away from this thing. And what this allowed for was late bound uh, objects uh, within, uh, within .NET. And um, a part of this is, part, is, is, is the dynamic language runtime. And this was my first foray, foray into something that uh, originally I thought was just uh, an augmentation to ASP.NET MVC, but it ended up uh, in retrospect being about this, this, uh, this capability of a language and pushing, pushing a language to its limits. And um, the dynamic language runtime um, is, the key word in here is the word runtime. And, what, and runtime is a very, very important keyword because it's it's different than the word language. Language and runtime together make make a thing. So when I hear people, uh, for example, uh, uh, I'll take a I'll pick on Ruby. Um, when people say that, if I ask them, you know, what kind of development do you do, or you know, what language they that they use, they'll uh, they'll say uh, Ruby, and I used to reply back with, oh, Ruby is slow, right? Ruby is slow. For me uh, today, this is not, this is not a, a really a valid statement um, because of this lesson. And the lesson is is that a language can't be slow. Language cannot be slow. A runtime can. So an implementation of a language can be slow. If I, if uh, for example, if we took C sharp, uh, so we have C sharp, uh, we've got the core CLR, which is .NET Core. We've got um, we've got .NET CLR 4.7, which is your full blown uh, Windows environment. And then uh, what are what are other uh, C sharp runtimes? Um, well, you've got uh, I think there was 
at some point in time a C sharp for JS, sharp JS or something. That was an implementation of C sharp, uh, but using using uh, the uh, JavaScript as a uh, as a foundational aspect. Um, there's also uh, in the game development world a runtime called Unity, and the they're all C sharp from a language standpoint, but the runtime implementation dictates its speed. So Core CLR, uh, I think Core CLR and 4.7 are, I would probably say pretty, pretty damn close. Um, Mono is another, another runtime implementation, but this was an important lesson that I learned with regards to uh, the difference between a language and a runtime. And uh, it was because of my exploration of a language and how, how far we can push a language to its limits, specifically the dynamic language runtime within C Sharp, that helped help me understand uh, th this this actual difference between uh, between the two concepts. Um, are there any questions with regards to language uh, versus runtime? And this uh, this evolution of C Sharp and uh, this idea of lambda expressions, and then uh, C Sharp and its uh, capabilities of Things such as like the dynamic keyword and and the uh, dynamic language runtime in C sharp. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns on that? Had you done Ruby at this point? Uh, so yes, yeah, so around the twenty eleven uh, time frame, uh, I had done Ruby quite a bit. Uh, a lot of my a lot of the Ruby that I was doing was for build automation on .NET uh, .NET applications. So I didn't do necessarily that much Rails, but just pure pure Ruby code. And um, what what helped what helped me decide to explore um, the dynamic keyword in C sharp was because of the the capabilities and power that I saw within uh, within Ruby and and JavaScript actually for for that matter, because because um, a lot of front end frameworks were uh, at that point I was using Knockout um, uh, for the for the project project that I was on. But uh, the forays into other languages um, helped me helped me see C sharp through a different lens, and uh, Ruby and JavaScript are are, are both uh, reasons for that. Uh, Ansible did not exist. Ansible did not uh, come out until uh, 20, uh, 2014, I think. Uh, I was using a framework called Albacore, and it was specifically used for building .NET applications. What Ruby runtimes are fast? If it makes sense to answer that later, um, I can answer it later. Uh, but there are there are quite a few uh, Ruby runtimes. Uh, just MRI. I'll I'll answer answer it later. But we'll we'll do a a callback to this part of the presentation. Any other questions? All right. So that's 2011 in the bag. Uh, 2012 is I think where things start getting. Uh, interesting. Interesting is a relative term. I mean, we are we are talking about coding, I guess. It's only so much interesting things that can happen. But uh, I think the evolution of web frameworks started started really showing uh, uh, showing power um, and showing new ways to think about application development, specifically single page applications. Um, around 2012 is where I think React. React came came out uh, probably towards the end of 2012. Now that I think of it, I think Angular was maybe first. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but we had uh, Knockout, Knockout JS, uh, Angular. We had Backbone, JS. Uh, of course, our lot of jQuery. Um, and then for serving up applications, Node.js uh, started started piquing my interest uh, specifically for building video games, doing game jams, uh, actually with Eric. Um, we did quite a few node knockout competitions and looking at interesting things such as WebSockets. Um, but a lot of that, a lot of that evolution is what I, is where I started. Uh, it, it was in 2012 when I started, uh, started seeing these things. And um, uh, maybe, maybe as a way of reminiscing, people can post uh, what, JavaScript libraries they were using back in back in 2012. We had uh, ext JS. I think that was one. Um, I'm I'm sure there were others. Uh, these are the ones that 
come immediately uh, immediately to mind. Um, yeah, backbone backbone JS uh, Aurelia. Uh, Aurelia has, um, was a little bit later, but yes, uh, Aurelia was uh, something that came out from uh, Caliburn Micro, I believe was it called Caliburn Micro. Caliburn burn. I forgive my spelling. It was a cool name for a project, but Aurelia was a was definitely a thing back then too. Um, and I think uh, you know, I don't know if uh, Vanilla JS was another movement that happened around this time period. Uh, for me, the interesting thing, the most interesting of the two frame uh, of of all these frameworks was was React, and this this was in line. Uh, this this was. Uh, I guess in conjunction with me using Node.js for for the game jams, and the foundational thing that React brought to the table was this idea of uh, at that point in time request animation frame. Right. The rest of the frame, all the other frameworks uh, generally had the same architectural aspect of manipulating the DOM. But it was React that really turned it, turned how we view uh, front ends uh, on its head, and it was this this idea of request animation frame that that brought things together. And the interesting thing in this lesson, uh, kind of was a was a backbone lesson, no pun intended, uh, to some of the things that uh, that I discover discover later on in the years. But request animation frame. Um, is synonymous to, to game development in the concept of a, of a tick so, or, or a game loop. We call this a, this is your game loop right here. So request animation frame uh, has a specific invocation time. Um, I think at that point it was uh, at 60 Hertz, which is 60 frames per second. And a game loop uh, usually, at least for modern devices today, um, specifically what's called your simulation loop, uh, runs at about 60 hertz. So it was interesting to see that the ideas, the idea of React actually lended from a concept inside of, uh, inside of game development, which is this idea of a, uh, of a game loop. And uh, what, I've, what I began to see over and over again was that there were quite a few. There were quite a few, and this was the lesson that I learned during this time was that there were quite a few innovations that were happening inside of games, and that kind of pushed, um, I guess, the what, what technology is able to do. Uh, request animation frame and the game loop was was one of them that that uh, React was uh, smart enough to actually uh, leverage and, and learn from. So we're going to see we're going to see how this uh, this happens uh, this this all evolves over time, but uh, is there any questions about uh, 2012 and the explosion of uh, JavaScript frameworks and how React was different than the rest of them? Any observations, comments, comments in general? You might also want to think about okay, well, request animation frame was. Was taken from uh, from games. Uh, what else could be taken from games? That's another idea to think about. So just a quick review. Um, in 2010, the lesson I learned was uh, a website with no JavaScript is your self is the best self documenting REST API that you can build, and to potentially consider that when uh, thinking about REST APIs. Uh, open source software in 2011, C-sharp, um, understanding the difference between a language specification and a runtime and how those two things come together to build uh, a platform you can work with. Um, and also using the full power of a language. That's also important. That's something I learned in 2011. Uh, 2012, I learned uh, that JavaScript is taking over the world and uh, the number of JavaScript frameworks out there is exhausting and never ending. And um, I also learned that uh, React was one of the unique ones that took a, took a, a slice from, from game, game development itself. 
Oh, that's uh, that's a that's a great uh, link. Uh, Joey Guerrera um, posted a link to Entity Component System, and um, uh, this is definitely something I'll I'll be touching uh, uh, touching on. Um, but ECS is another concept that could potentially be leveraged inside of um, inside of a line of business applications that we we potentially not have considered. So yeah, ECS is a is a good example. Uh, live ops with regards to mobile games, um, how how games such as Candy Crush and the big the big titles out there use uh, use uh, telemetry to determine uh, which behaviors uh, convert to the, the, most, uh, uh, the most money, I guess. Um, the innovations that are being pushed inside of games, uh, I feel are leaps and bounds what we, what we see in line of business applications. So another example of live, is live ops. But yeah, ECS is a good example. And we'll touch on, touch on that in, uh, in, the, um, in the later years that come by. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? All right. Okay, so 2013. What happened in 2013? Um, I ended up uh, burning out on open source development. Uh, it's something that I think our industry still struggles with as far as contributions for free. And um, it's, it's tough. It's a tough problem uh, with the software that we use out there. How, how do we balance uh, what we do outside of work versus what we do in uh, within work and how do companies sponsor uh, development of open source. But open source burnout was, uh, or reframing what open source contributions needs to be. But uh, this was definitely something that I started feeling uh, in, in 2013. And um, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, open source uh, contributors uh, you know, still struggle with this. I think it's it's a it's still a problem ten years later, uh, with the way we we approach software. Um, so just something to think about uh, with regards to uh, the open source software that you use uh, within your company. Um, do you sponsor it? Do you provide um, any kind of financial reimbursement to the uh, to the software that you leverage? Um, do you are you protecting yourself from uh, a bus factor in that if there's a bug inside of an open source system, do you have someone on your team that can actually fix it and understands the open source software uh, systems that you use? Can you even compile the thing by yourself? Um, so these are things that are uh, important to understand and, and keep, a, uh, keep track of uh, with regards to open source software. Um, but during this time, I started working doing uh, iOS development and uh, started getting into mobile development. Um, I'm sure there's quite a few people in the audience that are currently doing uh, mobile dev uh, with you know various platforms and uh, environments. Uh, I'm going to give you one big, huge tip with regards to mobile development, and I'm hoping that it will help you uh, with regards to um, just laying out a mobile view. Now, I know there's uh, quite a few uh, options out there with regards to layout. There's Flexbox. Um, there's a, there's a Swift UI. Uh, you have, uh, all of, uh, Android, Android widgets and, uh, all the things that they provide there. There's uh, masonry, uh, there is auto layout and then quite a few other things. Uh, react native, uh, has their own, uh, layout views. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. A whole bunch of stuff, and uh, over the over the time, uh, I've released uh, six properties, personal properties on uh, uh, with regards to uh, mobile apps. And the primary thing that I've learned with regards to layout engines is uh, for mobile is the idea of simplicity. So your layout engine should take into consideration. So for portrait mode, you have. 12, uh, 12 columns. So you have rows, you have 24. And for columns, you have 12. So imagine a grid, 12 across, uh, 24 up and down. Uh, but the grid itself has an implicit margin and padding. 
I'm going to show you an example of this. Again, this is really, really important. Um, it's something that, again, was distilled over a, a seven-year period of updating my apps for diff various devices. Um, let me find it real quick. Uno momento. I have found the link and let me get the image out from this. Uh, open image in new tab. So here's an example right here. Okay. So this, this approach to layout is going to uh, save you a lot of headache. Uh, the premise here is that everything is, these cells are absolutely positioned at a ratio uh, across these uh, rows and columns. And your margin and padding is implicit with regards to the layout within these cells. What this allows you to do is when, when putting a control or any kind of view within the system, you don't have to worry about these uh, margin, uh, margins and paddings. It's never something that you have to calculate. And the really interesting thing is that if you take, if you take a screenshot of, uh, if you, uh, so that's for the iPhone 8. Um, here is your iPhone 11, right here. So you're gonna notice on the iPhone 11, uh, you're, you have uh, the notch at the top and then you've got this padding at the bottom area here. But what this layout system allows you to do is to have retain a 16 by nine aspect ratio for all your applications and provide the same means of uh, laying out uh, a suite of controls. The other interesting thing is when it comes to fonts, your font structure is not based on any, any specific points, but it's based on pixel height. So if you want your font to be two cells tall, you have the height value that comes from these two values and you, I think you divide that by one point, um, you multiply that by 1.3, which gives you your points. So when it comes to laying out something for a smaller device like an iPhone 6S or uh, various devices on Android or for the larger devices on iOS, uh, you stick to this cell-based approach and then you can derive your, your points uh, for a specific font. So these two things combined, um, this idea of a cell-based layout system that is 12 by 24 with the implicit margins, which you never worry about, and then the font calculation scheme gives you, gives you a, a truly cross-platform uh, representation of whatever you want to work. And the general idea here is that this is, this is generic. It's not beholden to any specific framework. You can, you can apply this concept in, in, in whatever uh, mobile framework you end up using. But um, this is this is uh, the biggest uh, lesson learned from from doing mobile development. Okay, so we have uh, open source uh, burnout. This this layout uh, architecture that exists here. Take any application, any complicated app you can think of, take a screenshot of it, and then overlay this grid onto that app. And I I pretty much guarantee you that the layout is going to pretty much snap to this grid. So all the complexities that we have with Flexbox, Swift UI, Android Ridges, Masonry, uh, Auto Layout, and React Native can be distilled down to the calculation of an X, Y width and height for a given cell, cell and row. For any mobile developers out there, if you take one thing away from this, it's it's this layout and. Is this layout structure that will just simplify your life? <laughs> it uh, it it works really well. Um, I vetted it quite a bit, and um, I, I would encourage you all to uh, to give it a shot. Comments, thoughts, questions about uh, mobile development in general? I'd be happy to take some time to uh, answer questions about that. There's quite a few mobile frameworks out there today.
Is anyone doing mobile development right now at their day job? No, and I miss it. Yep. Eric misses mobile development. He's a masochist. Any place for further reading on, on that layout? Um, I call it, I, I coined it uh, air quotes layout theory. Um, this, is the, this is the actual math for, for doing what you saw um, on there. But, but, uh, but yeah, it's kind, of my, it's, it's kind of my own thing with regards to reasoning about how layouts should be done. Uh, the, general, uh, the general gist of how it works is you take the device, you want to target 16 by nine, you take the device's logical width um, in pixels for rendering, which assuming in portrait mode, and you divide that by nine, and that's going to give you uh, basically your aspect ratio for the height. Uh, with that into consideration, you have to put in um, a a margin and padding between each one of these cells that is hopefully a power of two of some type. So you've got your power of two in the in the center. You've got your gutters. You've got your uh, border, uh, call it the letterbox, around around the edges of your device, and then each cell derives to a certain um, to a certain width and height. And the cool thing is that uh, the the important thing to think about is with the margin and padding that exists in a cell. When you take a two by two cell, the resulting rectangle is a square. It's a it's as close to a perfect square as. Uh, can be so it, you don't get any scaling or skewing issues when you uh, when you take this approach, but um, the logic to perform that layout is is uh, uh, within that uh, link that I just posted. So the the good thing is that it's a sixteen by nine aspect ratio one uh, as far as uh, the device uh, the display wars, um, and uh, we've got iPads that are kind of pushing towards the 16 by nine, there's still four by three, but, uh, and then you've got uh, phablets and tablets that are uh, doing like uh, 24 by nine or 21 by nine. Uh, in those cases, you just center, you, you, you center the, the information uh, or the layout because the top and the bottom are usually allocated to dedicated OS specific stuff like a soft button or a, or a notch at the top that would uh, you know, affect your affect your uh, layout in general anyways. So you just kind of stick to that 16 by nine aspect ratio and you get, you get a layout that's pretty, pretty damn good. Did I answer your question, Kajana? Any others? Any other questions about mobile development, uh, the layout, the layout aspects? iOS development in general. All right. Um, so one of the other lessons, one of the other final lessons uh, was another uh, language was added to my belt. Uh, in this case, Objective C. So C sharp, we've got C sharp from as early as 2001. Uh, we've got um, Ruby coming in and JavaScript. JavaScript Ruby and now uh, Objective C um, is something that I had to become proficient in, and just just kind of a just kind of a culmination of what is happening so far. You know, I have I've understood I've I've began to understand the difference between a language and a runtime. Uh, I've dipped my toes into Ruby and JavaScript. Uh, we've got innovations coming in from different uh, verticals and paradigms. In this case. Um, game engines. And now I'm looking at languages that I never thought I'd be working in, um, in this case, Objective-C. Uh, C-sharp and F-sharp uh, was, was uh, quite a bit used in my open source stuff, uh, open source endeavors too. But uh, now Objective-C gets added to the list and each one of these languages brings, help me understand, help me reframe the other languages that I understood and it also showed me the ben the power of one language and its features over another. Um, but uh, this this was this was yet another one of those things where I I had a bias against uh, Objective C until I 
really understood its, uh, the capabilities that it brought to the table. And then I, I actually end up uh, liking it quite a bit now these days. So that was another lesson that learned, and I learned during that uh, time period. So that was 2013. All right, next year, 2014. Let's see what 2014 brought to the table. Um, 2014 was, uh, was really interesting in that it, uh, Hubot, Hubot, Hubot came out in 2014. I think it did, did it? So 2014 uh, for me is when I kind of went overboard and uh, got into a whole bunch of languages, um, exploring everything that was available under the sun. So uh, we're talking about uh, Clojure, um, Haskell, uh, digging more into F Sharp, uh, specifically OCaml, uh, Scala was on the list too. And um, of course, uh, Ruby, C Sharp, uh, F, uh, and the the current company. And what was really at this point, um, Node.js or JS, and then the runtime being Node uh, was also on this list. And um, this was this was a it was it was interesting to see how each one of these uh, specific languages uh, Java was on the list too. I think uh, streams was finally came out in Java. So uh, streams are Lambda expressions for, um, uh, for Java. It was 2014 when, when Java got it. <laughs> but, um, but exploring these languages, uh, again, it just really opened my eyes to uh, what facilities and capabilities exist out there and the benefits that exist with one ecosystem uh, over another. And uh, especially during this time period, uh, you also you also deal with um, a bit of overload. Like, how, what do you choose? What's the best? What's the language that's going to be the one that uh, you you decide to pick up uh, when success really matters? Um, and um, it's it was a tough question to answer back in 2014. Still a pretty difficult question to answer today. Uh, some of the, let me share some uh, presentations that help influence uh, this, this time frame. I'd encourage you to watch these. Uh, this one is called Simple Made Easy. Most of these are closure related. Um, closure had a, be, had a very strong influence um, on, on how I approach uh, language, language and software today. Interestingly enough, I don't do much closure to, uh, closure development at all in uh, in any production environment outside of uh, wh what I did in back in 2014. So we have simple made easy value of values, and one more. Are we there yet? Closure, closure keynote. Are we there yet? So these three presentations significantly influenced. Um, how I perceived a software. The question came up, uh, did the runtime play a big part uh, when you chose which language would increase the, uh, prob the probability of success? Um, so a runtime implementation uh, does inform uh, aspects of the language and it's important to consider a runtime uh, when you're thinking about like your deployment model. Uh, so an example is, uh, you know, Node.js, it's runtime. It, the language for Node.js is JavaScript. But the runtime includes uh, the the um, event the event loop, right? Uh, so sometimes uh, at this, uh, the tricky part here is that usually each one of these languages has a predominant runtime, and there's very few competitive runtimes that exist for for any one of these options. So uh, that that's where a lot of the confusion comes in when people talk about languages and runtimes is that they're one and the same because usually there's one dominant runtime and for a, a specific dominant language. So closure uh, closure has a uh, is built has a has a runtime implementation on on Java on the Java virtual machine and it also has a implementation on the CLR. There there are two different closure implementation runtimes um, and it also has a, a JavaScript uh, implementation CLJS. But the winning runtime for closure is JVM. Uh, Haskell has its its own general runtime. I don't think there's any competing uh, 
run times for Haskell, maybe uh, maybe Elm or uh, Reason. Uh, I think Reason's probably more F sharp, but Elm has an aspect of ha- Haskell you could call uh, Elm Haskell on JavaScript uh, or within within that uh, web based runtime. Uh, F sharp is mostly a CLR. Scala's Java Ruby is based on uh, the runtime uh, called C Ruby. Although there's variants of that, you have J Ruby, but C Ruby is the the winner. Uh, C Sharp, uh, until recently, I would say it would be your CLR, is your winning runtime, and then for Node.js, it's the V8 engine, and then Java is is the JVM. Uh, you mentioned your love for Lisp. Is this based on Closure, or uh, or did you later start using that uh, directly? Um, Closure helped me realize. Uh, some of the benefits of uh, of Lisp and language design. Um, my appreciation for for Lisp came uh, in 20, uh, 2017 is what, or actually twenty sixteen, and we'll we'll look at that together uh, when that when that year come uh, comes around. But um, but it definitely it definitely helped me uh, help help fix the lens for uh, for Lisp itself and uh, me having the appreciation for that. Um, so yeah, the lesson I learned there was that. There's there's a lot of benefits for each language, um, and I do think that there's a perfect language out there and a perfect implementation of a language for a specific problem. Um, and this is kind of where uh, I started uh, feeling those aspects to it. So, if you've never looked at another language other than um, one or two, I would I would I would definitely recommend exploring other languages, kind of seeing what's out there. Um, and we can go into details uh, w- with all the uh, different variations of languages um, if you all want to. Uh, let's uh, let's give a couple of um, yeah. Let's give some opportunity to ask some questions around around uh, these languages that I started dealing with, for better or worse. I think Kotlin came out came around uh, around this time also. And thanks for the question about um, my love for Lisp uh, coming from Michael's iPad. It wasn't Michael that was talking, it was his iPad that asked the question. So any other questions or um, elaborations around uh, potentially these languages that I started dealing with? Um, Any personal struggles you've had with exploring languages? All right, so this is all building up, right? We've got a starting point, this uh, this conceptual idea of what um, what the core concepts of a thing should look like. In this case, REST APIs. We expanded on that by pushing a language to its limits, understanding the difference between a language and runtime, uh, the explosion of JavaScript frameworks, and how things were uh, these uh, the the most unique one of them all was pulling from the concept of games. Um, building upon those ideas and looking at uh, languages as a whole and different distribution models where it's no longer web development, it's now thick client development on mobile devices and what that looks like. And then eventually getting to a point where uh, it's expanding to a language, lang- the study of languages as a whole. I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're liking it. Um, I'm hoping. I hope that people are finding this interesting. Uh, I know it's it's more like a, a abstract in thought as opposed to like specific examples. I try to correlate back to specific technical aspects of the system, but um, I understand that these are more like axiomatic and uh, abstract uh, lessons that are learned. Um, hoping, hoping that they'll all come together at the end of this presentation. All right. So then we have 2015. So 2015 was interesting um, in that. Uh, it was very non-language, uh, uh, non-tech related for me. Uh, at this point in time, uh, what happened was that the iOS game that I built um, actually became pretty pretty successful uh, to the point where uh, I was able to, it hit the number one spot in the app store. Um, it was a game that I ported, a web-based game that I ported over to mobile 
um, re-envisioned it uh, with my own like spin. And then on top of that, I made a pre-sequel in 2014 that also hit uh, the number one spot, but it hit the number five spot overall. And it got to the point where I was like, Hey, did this is a possibility of where I can, you know, stay independent and almost like a full-time game dev for a, for a long period of time. And during this time period, um, I learned, uh, I put together a list of uh, seven lessons learned in seven years of uh, indie game development. I'm going to share this link with y'all. And we have lessons uh, one through five uh, within this page. So um, I give a little bit of background of, of where, where my background uh, came from and kind of like a, a baseline appeal to authority on uh, what, why I think uh, y'all should listen to me. Um, take it for what, for what you will. I am a code hobo. Um, so that's worth, that's worth uh, keeping into taking into consideration. But um Quickly, uh, your lessons. Uh, your your lessons are. Uh, your lesson one is to when you think about a product, don't think about uh, the features of your product specifically, but think about what people are, are going to say about your product uh, for those people that really enjoy what you built or really love what you built. And taking this approach of of thinking about what your the perfect five star review for your product looks like um, is going to inform the general theme of your product and keep you from worrying about specific features of your product when they change. So lesson one, think about, uh, don't think about the features of your product, think about how your product is received and what your biggest fans will say about your product. All right, lesson two, um, as far as a product development is concerned, specifically with uh, micro companies or, you know, maybe like some part-time thing that you're doing uh, in the evenings, you want to ship and monetize small, uh, small vertical cuts. Um, don't try, don't spend a year and a half working on a thing and really soon and find that it fails miserably. Um, find that it fails miserably after three months. Cause I've had that. I've had products that I've tried to release and game ideas that I've released that did not, uh, did not work very well. Um, so for lesson two, it's, it's about, releasing as quickly as possible market and uh, vetting vetting and failing as quickly as possible. Um, specific to game development, I kind of give an example of how I would go about distilling uh, things that I like about a product and then making it, making my, my own. So if you're thinking about what product ideas you should create, think about things that you, products you love and you enjoy, but then break it down to, break it down and try to understand what specifically you enjoy or like about a product. Lesson three, don't, don't go after the big boy. Don't go after the same markets that the big boys go after. This is not, this is not, this is a battle you will lose very quickly. So uh, it's, 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 you don't want to make Facebook, but better because you'll never make Facebook, but better. You don't want to make Amazon, but better. Um, it's just a very difficult area to compete in. What you want to do is find niche markets that you that are underserved and serve those niche markets. Uh, specifically for uh, for the ideas that I have in lesson three, um, I primarily use Reddit to kind of be my uh, marketing funnel, and I look for uh, communities that have enough uh, a large number of uh, users, not too large, but large enough to where I can essentially provide a, a formula to see if a product is worth building for that kind of community. So an example would be a community with 82,000 members. If I have a conversion rate of 1.6%, uh, meaning that 1.6% of those people uh, could potentially buy my uh, uh, product, then that gives me uh, a lifetime uh, revenue at the bottom end. And 2.8% uh, is actually really good, a really good conversion rate on the high end side. So you're looking at 11,000 for 82,000 members, assuming that you're selling something for $5. Um, I've seen a 5% conversion rate on, on, um, on sales. And that was, uh, with, um, uh, Mario, uh, Mario run super Mario run for iOS. It was a free game that Nintendo put out with an app purchase to unlock the full game. They had an astronomical 5% conversion rate. It's unheard of to have that high of a conversion rate, but 
if you want to shoot for the moon, um, that's what you're looking at. Lesson four. Lesson four is about shipping something. You got to ship something. You can't, cannot be an idea guy. There's two, there's two types of people in a startup. There's one that brings the money and one that brings the tech, at least for tech, uh, technical startups. So if you're coming to uh, a, tech, a technological person and saying, hey, I've got this great idea for a product. I love great ideas, but you have to bring the capital. So you're either bringing the tech or the capital. And in this case, because we're in a development centric uh, environment, I'm concentrating primarily on the tech and to make sure you can ship, make sure that the, uh, the technology stack that you're using actually helps and supports your ability to ship to all the platforms that you want to ship to. So if you want to ship to PC, Mac, Linux, web, and mobile, and truly cross platform, vet that product and vet it quickly and make sure that you can actually ship. So I give an example of um, specific to game development, an example of trying to ship a very simple game to all the platforms, all right? Lesson five, um, this is a really important lesson. It's actually based off of, um, it was actually stemmed off of this article written by Paul Graham, it's in Hackers and Painters. Right there. And um, the biggest thing that he wrote was uh, this, this paragraph here, and I'll go ahead and read it. In a big company, you can do what all other big companies are doing, but a startup can't do what all other startups do. I don't think a lot of people realize this, even in startups. The average big company grows at about 10% a year. So if you're running a big company and you do everything the, the way that the average big company does it, you can expect to do as well as an average big company. That's it. To grow, that is to grow 10% uh, a year. The same thing will happen if you're running a startup. If you do everything the way the average startup does, you should expect average performance. And the problem here is that the average performance means you go out of business, right? The survival rate for startups is way, way less than 50%. So if you're running a startup the way that every other startup runs their startup, you're in trouble. So when you're looking at uh, when, when you're looking at uh, the lesson five, in, in essence, is challenge the status quo. If you, do, if you do the thing in your startup or your small application, the way that everyone else does it, um, you're, you're, you don't have any kind of competitive advantage. And uh, a lot of these things started to uh, solidify in 2010 when it came to uh, what I was doing with my own ideas and my own products that I was building as an individual, as opposed to like a large company that has the capital to build something, uh, capital to spend. And I give uh, multiple examples of um, historically how uh, people have uh, challenged the status quo and came out, uh, came out ahead. Uh, of course, game related, in this case, uh, Super Smash Brothers and League of Legends. But um, that's lesson five. Um, lesson six is something that I'll publish uh, soon. But uh, the gist of lesson six is that uh, it's actually based off of three books. I know this one's a little bit longer, but it's it's a very important idea. Um, how am I looking on time, guys? If someone can post, I know I'm at my stopwatch says 55, 55 minutes, um, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time at the end. But um, uh, with regards to um, uh, with regards to uh, lesson six, there's three books. A max one hour more, I will not be going for one hour more. Sounds good. Um, so lesson six is actually stemmed across uh, three books I, uh, I read uh, during this time, uh, during, during the past few years. Um, there's a, there's a, a book called Never Split the Difference. Uh, it's a book around, about negotiation. Negotiation, never... Uh, never split the difference. Um, I'll post the name of the book. There it is. Never split the difference. Uh, negotiate as if your life depended on it. Okay. Um, make sure to post that to everyone. Okay. Um, this book kind of influenced my ideas around uh, startups and, uh, and business ventures in general. Um, the next book is called The Elephant in the Room, or The Elephant in the Brain, sorry.
You've got the elephant in the brain. And then the final book is how to read a book. And I'll briefly go over uh, these for lesson six. How to read a book. Okay. So um, these three books combined provided me a framework uh, with regards to getting, getting someone to buy your product. And the lesson that these books taught me was that uh, logic and reason don't sell a product. And this is the unfortunate reality behind it. So uh, you've got the Latin terms, uh, I think it's a uh, logos, Forgive me if it's Latin, Greek, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I know we have got some uh, language, uh, ancient language connoisseurs out there that will correct me very quickly. It's Greek, thank you. Uh, language, uh, logos, pathos, and ethos. So um, logos, logos is for reason, reasoning things. Uh, I see pathos as a merit. Mer meritocracy kind of stuff. And then, uh, oh, sorry. Ethos is merit. And pathos is feeling. Okay. Um, and what I've learned is that the reasons why, or what the books showed me was that the reasons why people select a specific technology, a specific product, while at face value, are uh, seem to be uh, seem to be, uh, I guess, uh, foundationally uh, linked towards to, to uh, logos and ethos. Really, it's it's about it's about this uh, this uh, less less objective um, aspect of feeling. And um, over and over again, with regards to uh, selling my own products and my own ideas, um, I've found this theme to be a recurring theme. So lesson six is understanding that uh, your arguments will be presented in such a way that are based off of reason and merit, but deep down inside there's a, there's a motivation that exists that's unspoken, and um, that's what you want to reach for. That's, that's what gets you the specific sale of your product. A uh, specific example of that would be, uh, I'll actually give um, when I when I get into um, 2019, but this is this is a recurring thing that I've that I've seen uh, happen quite a bit actually. So that's lesson six, and then lesson seven is uh, you got to be positive. I mean, I think that's something I've learned is that um, have hope, right? You got to have hope. There's no uh, there, there's no such thing as like an overnight millionaire kind of overnight success. It's a long arduous process, and you gotta you gotta just show up and and have hope that things the the endeavors that you're pushing to succeed at will eventually succeed because it takes a very long time. I mean, just just from the last decade, I for for me my development career started in 2001, right? So there's a, there's a whole, whole thing of, of stuff, not including college that existed before, before we got to the point where in 2015, I'm actually able to say that I can sustain myself with my own products. So uh, those are the lessons that I've learned that I learned in 2015 with regards to startups and um, bootstrapping your own small companies and uh, what to do, uh, how to how to approach uh, these a means of you know making money on the side, some kind of passive income. Any questions? Questions, comments, concerns. Thoughts. Are you all enjoying the presentation so far or is this like the most boringest, worst thing that you've ever seen? 
Probably the latter. Taking notes. This guidance was awesome. Glad you liked it. Glad you liked it. That's good. I'm glad it's sparking ideas. Um, uh, can you talk more about being an optimist? Uh, yes, I, I think I can. Um, with regards to being uh, optimistic, uh, I find I found optimism in in the pessimism. Um, and I guess the way I well, one thing is that you just kind of get used to it. So uh, the first app that I that I build uh, is called a dark room. Um, and so, uh, so how did you market your products with Pathos in mind? That's good. I'm happy to talk about that too. So, uh, a dark room, a dark room released in, uh, November of, uh, 2013, um, in April of 2014, it went, uh, it hit the number one spot. It went viral, it hit the number one spot in the app store. Uh, I was getting, uh, 20,000 downloads a day. Um, at, at, uh, what was it at that point? I think I was selling it for 99 cents and that happened for 22 days. And during that time period, um, I was getting 300 reviews a day and all those reviews were not five-star reviews. Believe you me, I had a lot of one-star, uh, angry, very angry, angry people leaving reviews. And, um, this hurt a lot. Uh, over time, you get used to it, but this this was not a good point in time to have. Uh, this was not a good yeah. This was not a good twenty two days when I started getting these one star reviews. But I found um, I found positivity in these one star reviews in that the uh, the reviews for a dark room were mostly either five star or one star. Uh, there wasn't there wasn't anything in between. Very few, very very few reviews were were in between. So, uh, with regards to being uh, optimistic about this, the one star reviews communicated to me that the the target for my for for the product that I built was laser focused in that you either loved it or hated it, and for those that hated it, they this product wasn't for them. And so even though these one-star reviews were incredibly mean, um, they supported this idea that what I was doing was correct. And it's kind of this idea of like, you know, finding the silver lining. Um, but eventually, yeah, eventually I, I got used to it. I got used to the negative reviews and it just, it doesn't, it, it didn't, it doesn't wear on you as much. Um, so a part of, uh, a part of the being positive is just to, uh, just to give it time. Um, and, uh, over time it'll get better, uh, with regards to being optimistic, I'm definitely not the most optimistic person. Um, but having something called a mastermind is something that I've done in the past too, where you have a group of uh, like-minded people, uh, that are also doing like small business endeavors. And it's kind of like your therapy session, right? What happens during a mastermind meeting stays in the mastermind meeting. You're able to talk to people that are struggling the same way you're struggling. Um, and it's uh, really beneficial to do it that way. Uh, with, regards to, uh, with regards to my own products um, and how I, uh, how I ascribe to, to ethos, um, we'll cover that. Uh, I'll, t I'll talk about that uh, in, in the later years, in, in the 2019 stuff. Um, so how might you mark your product with Pathos in mind? That's well cover uh, Michael's iPad. Um, is there a way to dissuade people who aren't right for the product from buying it in the first place? Um, there, it's important to have your pro product page to have something that explicitly states what your product is about. And um, there are people that have uh, used used my product that will that I've said like, uh, I don't think you should use this product, man. I think you should use uh, this other thing. Uh, you should totally try X Y Z out. Um, specifically for my own products, uh, the Ruby runtimes that I that I've created for cross-platform development, uh, Ruby Motion and uh, uh, Game Toolkit, uh, those are the two runtimes that we'll we'll discuss in, in the later years uh, that are that we'll fi finalize with. 
but um but yeah i, I think there's nothing wrong with saying that uh this product isn't for you and uh this is why uh, do you have a target audience in mind at the beginning um interestingly enough uh, the, so aside from the niche audience that niche audiences that i say to target in a, in a funnel um the reddit the subreddits that exist out there that might be like some uh specific uh, uh which i'm calling um hobby or something that you you really enjoy yourself uh, outside of that it, it, it's it's just about building things that you yourself enjoy and what's interesting about this day and age is that that I, that approach of building things that you yourself enjoy would enjoy and then trying to sell it might not have been feasible um, even 10 years ago actually but with the ubiquity of the of the web today um, I think reaching out to the five billion people online i'm sure you're able to find at least a thousand people that have the same wavelength for the for what you enjoy and the premise is to sell to those specific, those 1000 people and then build another product it's all about small money for small products that are iterated on very quickly and letting those products build up over time and then uh, that that uh, position you for wealth your, your annual revenue target, I would say, should be 5000 a year for any given product. Start with that. Start with just selling something for $10. Um, but as far as that target audience, it's kind of think about what you really enjoy. Uh, think about your own psyche, your own, your own philosophies, what you like about a specific product, and then distill it down to exactly what you like about it. And then try to, try to sell that aspect to it. And find just find them just find the small group of people that enjoy what you enjoy. For me, that funnel is, uh, happens to be Reddit. So my target audience for myself for, uh, is is me myself, and then um, building a game that I like to play, and then I expand on that, and I just try to find the people that would also like to play the same game that I just built. It's not going to make you millions. It's going to make you hundreds in a year, <laughs> but you make 20 of those and suddenly that's, that's good money. That's really good money. It's about banking those things over time. Cool. So that's 2015. Any, any uh, uh, questions, comments, concerns on 2015? So we're at one hour, 10 minutes. Um, I plan to go for one hour and 30. So we got about 20 minutes left and uh, only a few more years to go. All right, let's move on. So 2016 is going to be short um, in that it's, uh, it's 2015 uh, on steroids. And what happened was that during this time period, I acquired uh, the company that uh, helped me with my success. Uh, so the company that created the product, I acquired the company that created the product that helped me with my success, I acquired a company. And that company was uh, called, uh, or that product was called Ruby Motion. Okay. So all my games, uh, all my iOS applications were built using this product, it was built using Ruby Motion. And now the, the technology stack, Ruby Motion itself, was something that I owned. Uh, the original developer uh, was part of uh, Apple, who his name is Laurent Sanzanetti, and um, he ended up quitting uh, Apple to build out uh, this uh, this uh, product called Ruby Motion, um, put it out for sale. I ended up purchasing um, this product to build my native iOS games and eventually uh, my Android games. And um, then I purchased the company itself because Laurent was ready to retire. He was like, I've, I've, I've succeeded at life. I've made enough money. I'm going to retire. And um, he was like, do you want to buy Ruby motion? And I said, all right, let's do it. So I bought, I bought Ruby motion from him and um, kind of a uh, kind of owning those things that helped me uh, create this, uh, the small successes that I built. So that's kind of what happened in 2016. Um, what, happened in 20 uh, what happened in 2017 was where things get interesting was for the first time um in my 
in my career, I was in, I was in a technology space that I knew nothing about. Right. How is Ruby motion built? How do you build a thing that allows you to build applications? This is not a framework. This is not, this is, this was something completely new to me. And what RubyMotion ended up being was that RubyMotion is a runtime, is a Ruby runtime, right? So we talked about uh, runtimes in general. Ruby was, uh, there's, there's, a, there's the MRI runtime. We've got MRI, we've got JRuby, uh, we've got Truffle. Uh, which is a uh, uh, truffle Ruby, which is uh, built by uh, Oracle, uh, Artichoke, Artichoke Ruby, uh, which is uh, actually a Ruby implementation on top of Rust, um, and uh, in this case we've got Ruby Motion, which is uh, what I, after acquisition, a few more years I renamed Dragon Ruby because that totally sounds cooler. Um, there's also M Ruby, and um, Pretty much any, uh, there's Opal. These are all Ruby runtimes. Iron Ruby, yes. Iron Ruby was a thing. But um, these were all Ruby runtimes um, that existed. And what I found myself was I was, in a, I was in a situation where the tech that I acquired, I had no idea how to, how to build or how to even code in. Um, I could code, but this was this was quite a this was quite a struggling uh, year for me. And um, 2017 was the year where I basically was just like studying in isolation um, on how to build a runtime. And it was during 2017 that I realized that the open source work that I did in 2011 that I burned out on gave me the um, the experience that I needed to actually uh, hit uh, approach this problem head on. So how to build a runtime, that is a very scary thing um, in itself. And from here, um, we will quickly talk about it. Okay. And uh, this was something that I realized in 2017. Can everyone see my drawings? I'm drawing stuff. You'll see it. Sweet. We got one thumbs up. All right. So uh, something happened in 2009. Well, something happened before 2009. There was a there was a student. There was a a guy uh, who uh, went to MIT. His name was Chris Latner. Okay, and uh, 2009, or around that same period, Apple hired Chris Latner. It's probably before then, but for the sake of the, this uh, fancy story, um, we'll go with this. They hired Chris Latner. And Chris Latner, uh, the interesting thing that he was working on, he was working on a project called LLVM stands for low level virtual machine. And it was a new type of uh, infrastructure that abstracted away the language, a specific language spec from the hardware that it ran on. So uh, you, have, you, have a you have a high level language, like let's say uh, in this case, C sharp, C sharp gets converted to uh, existing C sharp gets converted into IL, and then IL goes through another thing that gets com converted into bit code, which is your machine code, right? This is your x86 processor stuff, and that's what allows it to run on your machine. So uh, this comp this component here, this transition here, was coupled your intermediate representation was bound to the chipset architecture. And what LLVM did, and the ideas Chris Lattner put out was, was separating these two concepts. 
And there's a reason for, for, uh, for Apple hiring him. And the reason was in 2009-ish, Apple released the iPhone. And it was built using LLVM. Guess how many other companies were using LLVM at that point in time? Nada. Zero. Well, something interesting happened. In, and um, we kind of see it come together today is um, over time, uh, 2010 and onward, the iPhone did very well, very well, right? No one can argue that. So what happens? Intel wants, Intel wants in and says, uh, Intel wants to provide chips for the iPhone. Every company wants to provide chips for the iPhone. They want hardware, right? So what does Apple tell them? Well, Apple says, uh, you have to, pro you have to uh, provide us uh, your backend compiler, your, uh, your chipset architectures. You have to provide your chipset architectures to be compatible with LLVM, right? So you have your intermediate representation, which is kind of similar to um, uh, virtual machine opcodes that you would see inside of like uh, .NET or the JVM. And then there's logic here that allows it to be converted to bitcode for a chipset architecture. The hardware manufacturers had to provide this. If you wanted to play with that Apple and you wanted to be on Apple systems, you had to give us this. They had to give us this. And so Intel said, yes, we will do that. And uh, along with every other company, um, eventually what we see is, um, I'm, I'm sure uh, you've, you've saw this happening around 2017. You saw, uh, I think it was actually 2018. 2018, something, uh, some, something interesting happened, but uh, before 2018, 2000, uh, I would say probably 16-ish, uh, you hear that Chrome uses Clang uh, to, to do its compilation. And Clang is the C compiler for LLVM. So GCC was the other one. In 2018, something interesting happened. If you downloaded the .NET, um, the .NET SDK on Windows, you would have seen a radio button in there for an installation of something, uh, a beta quality. And guess what? It was Clang. And then what happened with .NET? 2019, you've got .NET Core. What is .NET Core? Is it, implement, it is a runtime, is the C -sharp, uh, C Sharp language implemented on LLVM. So during this time period, Chris Latner ended up quitting. So if we follow, if we follow Chris, he ended up quitting uh, Apple and went to Tesla. What does that mean? Tesla's using Clang. Right. Um, you've got, you've got. If you look at the Clang message boards, you've got Intel on this. You've got Netflix, Facebook. You can look at the context that exists in there. Facebook, basically every large company that exists. And what happened was at the end of 2019, um, essentially the entire world runs on Clang. It's pretty interesting. And then in 2020, what happened was that uh, Wasm created a backend back compiler for, for Clang.
right? So this series of events um, wouldn't have occurred if it wasn't for the success of the iPhone. But the moment that the iPhone was successful, hardware manufacturers had to get in line and make sure that the um, LVM architecture existed, backend architecture existed. And then what happened, what happened in 2021? The M1 processor. So Apple positioned their compiler tool chain to be leveraged um, across all these systems. And then they started becoming the hardware manufacturer themselves. So the reason you see a lot of these benefits that come out of the M1 processor is because the, um, the, the IR that is generated by LLVM directly maps to M1 opcodes. So they've created something that is blinding fast. And the beauty of this is that because of the ubiquity of Clang, those x86 applications that we all rely on that uh, Apple can't live without um, because that makes their ecosystem, when they compile to, through Clang, they can target this chipset architecture. This is one of the reasons why um, uh, WinRT didn't work was because WinRT forced you to use a subset, forced you to use an ARM subset of, um, of, the, of the applications either. You couldn't just write, you couldn't take a Win32 application and run it, uh, run it uh, in WinRT. But because everyone was building their apps now with Clang, this trajectory was, was now viable for them. So during 2017 and 2018, uh, we can uh, put those uh, two together, uh, was, was the realization that this was the trajectory of, uh, of tech um, moving forward. And at that point in time is when, uh, when I uh, started working on the Nintendo Switch. So during 2019, 2020, is uh, when I started uh, porting, porting my games to the Nintendo Switch. And interestingly enough, guess what the Nintendo Switch uses for its compilation? Clank. So now I'm in the situation, um, deliberately or accidentally, where the, the applications that I was building, build, uh, building using Ruby Motion, um, at that point in time, which was 2012, was a kind of a gamble right? The ubiquity of Clang, Clang wasn't there. But within eight years time, it had taken over the world, which allowed me to target the switch without changing any um, specific code with inside of my applications themselves, aside from abstracting out, abstracting out the UI layer. And so I accidentally fell into creating um, a runtime over that uh, over that time period, and um, this this realization happened uh, in 2017 and 2018. Right, that clang was a thing, and I I guess the lesson learned here is that the if you're inform if if you're if you took the time to I guess. Uh, see these small transformations that were happening with like Core CLR, WASM, uh, Chrome taking up a new compiler, the beta version of Clang shipping with uh, the .NET framework. Um, the writing was kind of on the wall that this was going to happen. Um, even Android, uh, as, far, as far as API 26, uh, now uses Clang. So... Uh, there was that sunsetting process where it said all Android uh, Android apps uh, must must uh, have a have a min target of uh, API twenty six. The reason for this was because they were going to shift over to Clang. But um, it it's frustrating uh, looking back that the companies that 
were making these transitions didn't communicate it to the devs that these transitions were being made publicly. But um, by, by 2019, uh, the final domino fell down, which was when uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, completed Core CLR, right? And uh, MS Build was uh, MS Build was about uh, building things in C Sharp, or building things in C plus plus, using Clang. And that brings us to 2020. So then, 2020, um, the work that I did for the Nintendo Switch uh, ended up uh, ended up solidifying. I had to wait for I had to wait for uh, Windows Desktop to get to the point where. Uh, it would it would support uh, Clang based compilation, and uh, what I ended up building was expanding was the Ruby uh, Ruby Motion runtime into something that uh, is built on Clang. Uh, interestingly enough, with the eight year head start. So here's an example. This is this is Ruby code, and uh, this is being run live in the browser right here. So see, uh, I can actually change. So the uh, background value is that. If I can change it to 255, save, and it hot loads the environment. This is Ruby code running uh, in the browser via Clang compiled with the WASM, the WASM backend compiler. And what you're getting is, so I'm, I'm showing how to create a star field. But what, you're, what I'm able to create is, um, a rendering of a of like a warping star field where this code runs on PC, Mac, Linux, iOS, Android, uh, web, console, everything. Um, and this was all based off of the lessons that I learned from, uh, from the journeys that I've taken with C Sharp and understanding these other languages. And uh, the runtime itself ends up uh, ends up uh, learning from you know game de game development and the things that have been done right, and this has to be right one. Uh, so the dream of right one uh, run everywhere, it is definitely something I have to be able to do because I've got products out there, and I want to stay sustainable. So how do I get how do I lower the upkeep? How do I beat the averages, right, um, for the products that I currently have, and make sure I can uh, deploy to all platforms that are available? And so um, this is this is the this uh, Dragon Ruby is the runtime, and Game Toolkit is a um, uh, expansion of that runtime. And yeah, the le leverage is important, um, and it it I could have missed it uh, if I didn't take the time to really understand what, what was happening underneath the seams, but um, that was something that just kind of, it was, it was a gamble that was made before and it was a strategic aspect that over time um, led, led to where we are today. And uh, the question comes is that, what, is the, what does the future look like? And uh, with that, I'd like to talk about uh, some ideas on quantum computing, uh, which I know very little about, but um, we're at the last last uh, piece of our piece of the presentation. Um, uh, and as far as the runtime, what I've decided to do was is do a flash sale for the runtime itself. So here you can get uh, a license to the to the cross platform uh, implementation, DragonRuby.org, um, and uh, you can redeem a, a free a free standard license. Uh, the pro license uh, gives you uh, the ability to target iOS and Android, um, and uh, gives you some extra capabilities around uh, uh, spinning up an embedded web server within within the runtime itself, um, along with some other cool things. But uh, the standard license will get you uh, export capabilities to PC, Mac, Linux, and um, Raspberry Pi and um, uh, Wasm. So you got one day, three hours, and fifty three minutes to take advantage of it. But um, uh, there was one question. Hindsight is twenty twenty. But do you think this was deliberate? Did Apple have fifteen a uh, fifteen year plan that started with LVM and ended with M one? Um, I do believe so. Uh, the reason for that 
the reason I think so is that um, Apple wanted wants to control not only uh, the, their platform, so they want to control their hardware. And uh, inclinations of this started happening uh, when uh, they I I saw them starting to become a manufacturer of hardware the moment Apple Watch came out, because the moment Apple Watch came out, they provided. Uh, if you look at the description of the Apple Watch, as far as the chipset uh, architecture is concerned, it's called um, ARM ARM eighty six. I think was the name of the chipset. I may be mistaken, but they they started they started exploring and experimenting with this idea of of having um, hardware that was built by Apple um, and uh, targeting targeting LLVM. Uh, the interesting thing with LLVM itself was that its approach to uh, optimization and, and uh, compilation is done through something called static single assignment. And um, it's a technique that, that is used uh, for compiler optimization that isn't, uh, it, it's basically a virtual machine that's based off of registers instead of a stack, instead of the stack. So um, a lot of the virtual machines that uh, exist out there, uh, Ruby's virtual machine, uh, C sharp's version of are stack based, but um, uh, this Chris Lautner, well, a lot of people had uh, uh, aspects of uh, static single assignment, but but uh, LLVM was the first one to take a register based um, approach to approach to a virtual machine, and that's what gives it uh, some of its capabilities and speed. Um, is that the thing that makes Swift a safe language? Uh, the thing with Swift is based off of LLVM. Uh, I mean, that's that's kind of uh, what it comes down to. As far as uh, it being a, a statically typed safe language, that is um, the language spec. So the language spec states that it has these capabilities and LLVM and its uh, intermediate representation has the facilities to allow for a language like Swift to be expressed in, in, um, in a, in an intermediate representation in assembly link, in an assembly based code. All right, how are we on time? We're at one hour and 30 minutes. So I can talk about quantum computing or we can end here. Do you all wanna, do you all wanna hear about uh, the ideas in con about quantum computing? It's probably a 10 minute, 10 minute thing. And I'll be going 10 minutes over, but um, okay, cool. We've got at least one person and that's good enough for me. Okay, so 10 minutes and uh, we'll be done. Uh, everyone, uh, everyone has the link uh, to uh, the download, the standard license of, uh, of the runtime uh, that is a culmination of, man, 10 years, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy to see how all, the, you know, all these things put together and compounded to uh, reach where we are. Um, and if you have questions about the runtime, I'd be able to, I'll be happy to answer them after uh, the explanation of quantum computing. Okay, so quantum computing is, is pretty interesting. And it's all based off of the concept of polarized light. So we have our sun here. Happy little sun. And the sun has rays that are sent out. I'm gonna give you, uh, and what I'm gonna show you is a uh, two concrete applications of, of, quantum, uh, of quantum computing, okay? So the interesting thing about these rays of light is that they are composed of atomic, um, in, in a separable constructs called quanta, in this case, in the form of a photon, okay? Now there's an interesting aspect of photons is that they have a orientation, right? So a photon has an orientation, okay? And this orientation can be measured. This orientation can be measured. And the two, the two primary measurements that are used 
for the orientation of a photon are HV, which stands for horizontal and vertical. Horizontal and vertical. And then AD, which stands for anti-diagonal and diagonal. Brilliant names. We are not the only ones that have problem naming things. And um, actually, we we already we already uh, see this. Sorry, um, we already use this capability, and this is for uh, 3D movies. So when you go to a 3D theater, we no longer see uh, red and blue screens, right? It's no longer red and blue, but we see full color, and it uses uh, the polarization schemes. Polarizations of HV. HV and AD. So one of your lenses is um, only allows um, HV light in and your other lens only allows uh, AD light in. Okay. So that's polarization. Now the question comes is that how do you separate light into uh, in, into these uh, two polarization schemes, right? So that's the question. How do you take arbitrary light and separate it into these schemes? Well, it turns out that there's um, a ubiquitous, uh, a very plentiful substance out there called a calcite crystal. I probably told a calcide, calcide crystal. And calcite crystals are able to take an arbitrary photon coming in into a specific calcite crystal and then come out as, as a specific type, HV or AD, depending on the type of cal cal uh, calcite crystal that you have. Okay? So a photon coming in when sent through a calcite crystal, will have one of these orientations, guaranteed. So here's the tricky part with quantum computing. There is no way to know what the original orientation of this photon was. You can't measure that. It's a fundamental concept of, uh, it's a fundamental property of quantum objects is you cannot measure you can't both know what it was and what it is at the same time. And it's an important aspect of, of, um, of quantum computing. And this is how, and, and uh, one, of the, one of these, asks, the reason for this is specifically for encryption. Okay. So quantum computing allows for unbreakable encryption. And people will say that's, BS, it's impossible to have unbreakable encryption, but quantum computing can, can provide this. All right, so we'll, I'm gonna explain that real quick. All right, so for, for, for a letter, let's say if, I, if my message was A, A can be converted into uh, a binary representation of uh, ASCII 65. Uh, I have no idea what, what the binary representation of 65 is. We'll, we'll stick with, um, it's eight bits. We'll, we'll, one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll say, we'll say that, yeah, whatever this is, is an ASCII representation, right? Okay, so you have a message that's composed of, uh, of ASCII rendered as binary, right? All the way through. The message can be however long it needs to be, okay? There's a approach to encryption called private key encryption. And so you've got your message that is, uh, that is uh, unencrypted. And then you have a private key that also has a binary representation. The binary representation of your private key must equal the length of the message, okay? And what this does is this, this private key 
explains how to decrypt the message. What it says is that if the value is zero, leave the bit unchanged. If the value is one, flip the value of whatever bit is there. Everyone see that? So if my encrypted message was 01110000 and my private key was 111000, the unencrypted message would be flip the bit, flip it, flip it, don't flip it. Do I have four, seven, whatever? And then don't flip it, don't flip it, don't flip it, right? Something like that. Okay. So the challenge comes is that how do you translate, how do you transport this private key securely? And the answer is with current technologies, you can't. It's why ambassadors for, um, uh, ambassadors for like uh, uh, different nations actually actually go to uh, their specific places with a briefcase. And this briefcase or flash drive, probably in this day and age, has a set of primary uh, has of um, a set of um, uh, private keys. So each key can only be used once, and the secure transport of the key is done through sneaker net. You got to take it with you. And this is the problem that exists with uh, encryption as it exists today until quantum, uh, until quantum computing. So the way quantum computing works is we'll say we have a person named Alice and uh, Alice has a private key that she needs to send to Bob. Okay, Bob is the receiving end. The really interesting thing about this private key is when she sends it over, she randomly picks a set of calcite crystals. In different orientations. So that could be HV orientation. This would be anti-diagonal, anti-diagonal. This would also be AD, HV, AD, HV, and HV. So, the, so these bits are photons of light that are inside of a specific orientation, either horizontal or vertical for zero and one and anti-diagonal, diagonal for zero and one for, these, for this calcite orientation here. And what happens is that Bob on the receiving end also select, uh, randomly <coughs> selects an orientation for the calcite crystals. Bob does not know what Alice has selected. So he might have selected different ones. And then these are these match. These match. These do not match. And so on and so forth. So we'll say the rest of them match. OK. So when this data, which is a photon of light, is sent to Bob, he's going to get a value back for this private key, which might either be zero or one based on how the calcite crystal um, shoots the, the photon out. After receiving this information, they both publicly, uh, they both publicly post their, the, the calcite crystal order that they use. They can use any, uh, it doesn't have to be encrypted. They could just put it on Twitter. It's like, Hey, here, here was the calcite crystals we used to do this uh, to, to, to do this communication. And what Bob knows, now both Alice and Bob know where their calcite crystals matched. And their private key, their shared private key, is only those items that match themselves. So 0, 1, 1, 1. And this is the private key that they would use to uh, encrypt their messages. Now, the interesting thing is that if there's a bad actor that's listening here, the moment they intercept the message and measure the orientation of that photon, it changes it. The fact of observing a photon, the fact that you observe a photon changes its polarization. So 
So you can detect you can you can detect that someone was uh, listening in onto your uh, onto your uh, message or the exchange if the private key that was derived on each end is not able to in, uh, decrypt uh, a message successfully. You know someone was uh, was listening in on the channel at that point in time. And this is a fundamental aspect of how photons work is that the moment the moment you me measure it 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 changes its polarization. A calcite crystal if this was in the if this was in the AD orientation and this calcite crystal separates H and V light pads there's a 50-50% chance that this will either become H or V. And there's no way to get, no way to measure this thing before before sending it to the through the crystal itself. If, if this calcite crystal had an HV orientation, in this case H, it would it would end up you know on the H side. So you, you have uh, detectors for H. Is it horizontal or vertical? You've got your crystal. If a photon comes in, it'll either go to H if it's uh, if it has an orientation of horizontal, it'll go to V. If it has an orientation of vertical, if it is anti-diagonal, diagonal, it's a 50-50% chance it'll go to either H or V. There's no telling um, what, what definitively what that chance is. So any orientation that is held by the bad actor, the probability of them matching correctly is possible, but eventually they'll get it wrong. Where these were, where the where the match of these two were correct, and your private key exchange has to be long enough to to um, handle for this probability of getting a, getting these orientations incorrect. So if you want to send a three megabyte um, three megabyte message, your private key uh, exchange probably has to be ten megabytes to to um, accommodate for these for these mismatches. So that's an actual that's an actual application of of uh, quantum compo computing uh, with regards to uh, encryption and decryption. Does that break everyone's brain? Because it breaks my brain. <laughs> so here's the crazy part, and this is this is where uh, things get get interesting, is that. You can create photons that are that are entangled. In that, if a photon has an has an H V polarization or a, a H polarization, an entangled photon, once measuring this original photon, is known to have a correlated orientation. It could be V. A or D, it doesn't matter. The way these photons are created is by taking an atom, every atom, and um, having it release energy such that the electrons that are within that atom either either um, increase or decrease it, uh, two um, orbital frames. So an atom has got like uh, I think two electrons in the primary orbital frame. Uh, I think four, eight or four in the next one, 16, so on and so forth. So your fluorescent lights, uh, if you have any where you're at, uses this concept of creating photon, uh, photon energy and decreasing the energy, raising the energy of the fluorescent light and then decreasing it again. So doing that, you can have a number of photons that are entangled. So for a specific photon, with ever, whichever orientation it has, it is known what the values of these photons are. And these can be defined based on how you, how you create this uh, inner, uh, energy variation. Now, here's the beauty of this. If you created a circuit, so if you think about uh, computer circuits, in the general sense, you've got your AND gates that take in an input, right? Or yeah, if you have a, I think that's an AND gate. 
AND gates are that. We'll say that that's an AND gate. You take in two inputs and you get an output. So uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1 gives you 1. If these end up being photons that are coming into this calcite crystal that performs this transformation, you get a value coming back for this for, for the resulting photon, and then this might be an output or a lead uh, a lead value. But by the calculation of this value, you've as a side effect have calculated the circuit elsewhere. Now the importance of this is if you take an example such as uh, factoring prime numbers, if you take a very large prime number, of course it ends in one because it's gotta be odd or something. Attempting to figure out it's, um, to see if this is divisible by, let's say the number 17, you also as a side effect, because, because of the entanglement, also answer a correlated number and whether it's divisible by maybe 97 and then maybe another prime, and then another prime. And the interesting thing with these types of problems is that they're hard to, hard to deter, uh, calculate, but easy to verify. You can tell if this number uh, results, in, uh, results in the, uh, these prime factors results in the original prime by multiplying these numbers together. That can be done in, constant, in um, near constant time. But this idea of of a circuit being constructed of entangled um, atoms that end up being end up creating side effects based off the original computation gives you this performance boost to where uh, to where conventional encryption mechanisms for for primes um, is no longer a valid way to approach encryption. So. That's in a gist what quantum computing is at a hardware level. Now the question comes is, what does that look like at a language level? This is something that LLVM can do. What do our virtual machines and languages look like for the future? And maybe that's the next, that's the next uh, foray for, for uh, the runtimes that uh, I've accidentally created over this 10 year period. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you, Justin. That was definitely Justin. Gosh, sneezes are iconic. I, I, didn't, I didn't take you off your uh, track there, did I? Okay, so how does teleportation work? This is an interesting question. Teleportation is not possible. First, you have to have all the, um, you have to have enough electrons that are entangled in such a way to allow for someone to teleport. But then you have to tell the one side, one side, the orientation and the measurements for each, uh, each photon that was, uh, that was measured. So, because you, you, you know the resulting, uh, so you know the resulting side uh, on the other end. And yes, that will that entanglement will occur, but that message transformation has to happen. Nothing is faster than the speed of light. So you don't know the orientation of the entangled photon until you are told the original photon's value. And to translate, transmit that data for the number of atoms that exist in a human would take 12 years given a bandwidth of one terabyte, uh, one, uh, one terabyte, uh, terabit per second it would take 12 years to get that information over. So teleportation is possible if the location you're wanting to teleport to um, is 12 light years away. I don't know, I guess. You can get there in 12 light years, yes. But it's not feasible for anything in the, um, uh, on Earth because it would take you 12 years to get there. So teleportation is it can happen through entangled items, but it's it's not realistically feasible. So we're at one fifty six, guys. I kept you all um, longer than I would have liked. Uh, I hope you found the ideas and the lessons uh, within this quasi 
excuse me, quasi presentation helpful. Um, I hope you try learning a new language. Uh, I hope you uh, give uh, the products that I've created a shot and um, start building things for yourselves. Uh, start building small, small things for yourself using, uh, using products that I myself built to build small things for myself. <laughs> Yeah, and I know there was a lot to unpack. Um, I hope, hopefully, the links that I provided were helpful. Uh, the links to the books were helpful. Um, again, a lot of these things are generally generally abstract, and it's the evolution that I took uh, with regards to where I am today, and kind of looking forward to uh, what it, what is next. And um, parts of this can be applicable to run of the mill line of business application development. Um, and parts of this are to challenge, challenge the status quo and see what's possible uh, for software in the future. <laughs>